We looked together at the Song of Solomon, and then we moved into the book of Ecclesiastes. And today we consider chapter 9, the passage read by Pastor Dwight just a little bit ago, as it talks to us again about life under the sun, that is, life as we know it on the earth, the life that you and I are called to live right now. Now, my wife works at the district office of our churches, and uh, she's the office administrator, and we just came through district conference. It's pretty big time, pretty interesting time, intense time. And so for the last probably 120 days or so, she has really been quite focused to be able to prepare everything that culminated at that conference. As we move through those days, I could see her working very intently and, and giving it her best. And uh, so we had our conference last week, and, and so I said to her, uh, hmm, why don't we plan our vacation? Uh, that's one thing. And then another thing, you know, so we can set it officially. We've already talked about it, but let's go ahead and get stuff done on that. And then I said, how about we uh, go out for dinner and a movie tonight? And so she was gung-ho about that. Now, back in 2014, my wife experienced uh, the need of radiation, and when she went through whatever it was she went through, we, we had the, the plan for 30-plus treatments all laid out for us, and so she went to receive those, and I said to her, you know, your time's my time. However I can help you, I will. Whatever you need, I'll do. And um, so... Tina Becker had loaned her the series called Downton Abbey. It is a movie film series. The writer has created a family that is experiencing changing times, changing culture. Some of you have been afflicted by that series also, and you've had to watch it or chosen to watch it. So I sat there watching it. Now, I noticed something very interesting as we watched it. There, there were several daughters of the distinguished family, and my favorite in that whole series was Sybil, and Sybil got killed off early on. So I'm thinking, good grief, the writer didn't need to write her out. She was adventurous, she was creative, she was daring, she was pretty, she was fun, she was, she was a child that you wanted to follow a little bit here and see what was going to happen. But it ended up that they wrote her right on into death, right in, in the script. Well, this week we went to watch one of the follow-up movies. And wouldn't you know it, the writer is still writing people into death and writing them off the screen. As a matter of fact, he took somebody, and I won't give you a true spoiler alert, but he took an old person and he wrote them she was, I uh, almost gave it away, <laughs> wrote her right off the script. You know, everybody on that set, everybody in that series has an appointment with death. And everybody sitting in this room has an appointment with death. And in our chapter that Solomon is dealing with, he deals with his whole idea of us coming to that appointment of dealing with death. But he does not stop there. All of life is not going to be fair. All of life is not going to fit real nicely. And your father probably told you you're going to have to deal with it. If I'm right, say yes. yes. If you had a father that gave any time to you, he probably told you you just need to deal with it. It's part of life. Life is not going to always give you what you want. Now, if you follow Christ, life is not always going to give you what you want. It is not always going to work out. God's ways, as we'll continue on in this series and figure more into, His ways are way beyond us. We've already seen it, but we, we'll hear it echoed again. His ways are way beyond where our ways are. His thoughts are way beyond our thoughts. He is holy, we are not. He is just, we are not. He is perfect, we are not. His ways go on and on, and the attributes of our great God are beyond our fullest understanding, even in our best description. So we get the picture of God being holy and, and high and lifted up and mighty. But, but in this life, even if we follow him, we're not always going to have things work out the way that we think they ought to work out. There are going to be mysteries of our universe. Dave Holdren came through, Dr. Holdren, a number of years ago to our church, 
And he called those things mysteries, and he said we need to put the mysteries in the mystery bag of our life because we do not understand them. There is no explanation that makes good sense or comforts our heart. They're there. What is it that causes one home to get blown down and another home to stand up when a tornado goes by? It may be a righteous person that lived there, but their home got annihilated. Or what is it that takes a hurricane right through one area and you'll see some house standing and some people say, well, it was built better. It was built with all of these great assets. But let me just say this, many homes that were built with great assets are still leveled. I grew up in the Midwest and I understand something of tornadoes. And so sometimes those things happen and they just don't make sense. So today in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, while living under the sun as we are, we're going to look just a little bit about what he says about two certainties. The first certainty he talks about is death, and the second is he says we're going to face uncertainties. We're going to look at him just for a little bit and see how to live a meaningful life while still living under the sun. First he talks about death being certain in verses 1 through 10. He says to us that life and death are in God's hands. They're not ultimately in your hands or mine. Life and death is ultimately in God's hands. He has created life. And this is why we respect life and view it as so important. And let me just say this about it. We view life very important whenever it's within the womb. We do. And we also view it as very important whenever it's elderly and in a nursing home, broken down at the end. We view the whole spectrum of life as being in God's hand, and it's up to God to decide. Can I get a witness somewhere in this house today? It's up to God to decide what is going to happen with those particular people and with our bodies when we get to that point. Ben Franklin was talking about some of the political documents, and he continued on and said this, in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. Well, Solomon says this, only God truly knows the future. Now, this is not suggesting that you don't have a will and that we don't get to make choices in here. There is cause and effect. If you were to take a gun, put it to your head and pull the trigger, there is a cause, there is an effect, and we will have a funeral later in the week. That would not be good. We don't want that to happen. But let's look at it on the positive side. There's some cause and effect. Some of you play music, and whenever you practice your instrument, you love that. You feel good about it. You feel confident in that. And so then you have to go to your lesson. And so when you go to your lesson, you're comfortable going to the lesson. Some of you right here in this section especially are facing driver's tests and you've got your hand on a 10 and a two, and when you have your hand on a 10 and a two, you know you're ready. You know where the gas pedal is, where the brake pedal is, you know where your seat belt is, all this stuff you know. And you're comfortable in that because you're prepared for that, and you take your test with your driver's ed or with your officer. You do that. So we do have some choices that we're gonna make within this life. But he says death is an appointment every one of us will keep. And on this Father's Day, instead of giving a message just about fathers and stuff like that. We're coming into this whole thing in a different way today. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 9 and 27, it is appointed unto every one of us to die. Every one of us has an expiration date. Would you nudge your neighbor and say, you're going to die one day. Go ahead and do it. And if they look dead, tell them you're wondering if they already are. But let me just say this about death. There's a common misconception in our culture right here in Pennsylvania, and I've spoken about it before, but I want to say it again, but I say it in kindness because there's no other way that I should say it. You don't just go to heaven just because you die, but you have to die to go to heaven. We go to heaven because we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the question comes back to the real crux of the matter. What will you do with Jesus? That's the real apex question that we all must deal with. Solomon talks to us here in verse 2. He tells us good people and evil people share a common destiny. Even the animals around us, and we're seeing a lot of animals on our roads right now. All of us share a common reality. That is, if we're living one day, we will die. So we share that. But good people and evil people do not share a common eternity. If you trust in Christ and trust in Him as your Savior, you'll be able to spend eternity in heaven with Him. That's why Jesus came to the earth. That's why He died on the cross, because we have sinned, all of us, and come short of the glory of God. That is the perfect standard of God. And He wants us to be able to confess our sin and to trust in Him. And so as believers, we are trusting in Him, and we are confident that Jesus Christ has conquered our last enemy. And our last enemy is what? Death. 
and he has conquered that. Jesus said this of himself. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who lives, uh, who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked. This week, Pam and I had an experience where our lives flashed before us. We took an old pickup from this campus and drove down pulling a trailer to Harleysville. We took the turnpike and we were going to pick something up we were buying there and we were going to pull it back. And uh, while we were there, we looked at the thing we were going to buy and then I walked back toward the truck and I noticed something hanging out underneath. It looked like one of those large floor mats, like at a doorway for, you know, a big, big one, one of those eight foot type of jobbies hanging down underneath. I thought, what in the world could it be? And when I got over closer, I realized, oh my stars, the back bracket of the gas can, uh, gas tank broke and the gas tank was sitting five inches from the ground. We were driving down the freeway. Man, if that thing had touched, I don't think I would be here right now because they had a full tank of gas. Unbelievable. Our lives flash before us. How do we face this idea of death? In verse 3, he talks about it. We try to escape. We try to escape it. In our culture today, we have about 77 million baby boomers moving into the older part of their life. And as the baby boomers move into the older part of life, the anti-aging creams, medicines, shots, muscle toners, all this kind of stuff are offering themselves to us. But you know what amazes me is while we were standing there, we talked to a couple of guys and it was interesting to listen to all of the stories that they wanted to share. One was an avid Donald Trump Republican and the other was an avid Joe Biden Democrat and they were friends. Did you know you could be friends and have differing views? Amen. Some of you did not know that, but now you do. They, they were an odd pairing, <coughs> but they were friends. And they were, they were talking, but I finally brought the conversation back at least a time or two to really the bigger question is, what will you do with Jesus? We try to re do everything we can in life to get all of our philosophies and all of our theories and all of our neat little packages worked out. But at the end of the day, they don't work. Another thing he talks about in verses four to six is endurance. He talks about a lion that once roared and was majestic. Think about Lion King. And just big, regal, royal. But now, that lion's met his demise. And some of you have a little dog that you can put up here in your arm, a lap dog. I don't know why you have it, but you do. <laughs> he said, it's better to be a live dog that can do something now under the sun. Better to be that than the dead lion who can now do nothing. That's what he's saying. He isn't saying there is no eternity. He is saying that there is Nothing left for that person to do on earth that has died. It's only the living that have something. And then there's something else we must do with this whole idea of death. We must choose to accept it. And we must choose the idea of forgiveness. Some of you have had a loved one die and you need to come to the idea of forgiveness. Maybe to someone else who has caused something that has caused that death. When our four-year-old cousin received the transfusion that was wrong at the doctor's clinic in Olathe, Kansas. Sugar instead of salt or salt instead of sugar. We had the funeral a week later, just a common flu. When my friend's daughter was 17, following along in a car behind them and was killed in a car wreck, they had to de decide how they were going to deal with that. Our cousins that had a four-year-old, they didn't want to sell their vehicle because it still had prints of the kid, Brandon, when he had touched the door. We don't really want to sell it, but they finally did. They said, we've come to the acceptance 
Our child is with God. To be absent from the body, to be at home with the Lord, provenient grace, God coming to us when we can't go to Him. And they came to that acceptance, and they were able to forgive that doctor so they could move on. Our friends had to forgive the drunk driver so they could move on. And they had to accept the fact that their daughter was dead. It's easy to sleep through a message like this. But in a few weeks, months, couple of years, you'll call the church office, or at least you'll call the funeral home. And when you call them, you'll say, my loved one has passed away. All my ministry have received these calls. All my ministry long received these calls from people who are not prepared for that moment. It's going to happen to every one of us one of these days. And on Father's Day, it doesn't hurt us to be reminded of this because it is a reality. But we have hope. And our hope is in Jesus Christ who has conquered death. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4 say it this way. Praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is so good. And by raising Jesus from death, he has given us new life and a hope that lives on. God has something stored up for you in heaven where it will never decay, be ruined, or disappear. It'll never happen. Erwin Lutzer shared a story from the Middle East when he said, when he said a fellow, a merchant, sent his servant to town to do business for him, to buy some stuff and to come back. And so he goes into Baghdad to buy whatever it is that the merchant had told him to go get. And then while in town, he sees Lady Death. And when he sees Lady Death, he's scared out of his head and he races back home. And he said to his master, he says, I want you to do something. I want you to give me your fastest horse. I want to be able to go to Samara. And if I can just get over to Samara, I'll be out of the way of Lady Death. I saw Lady Death in town today. So the master gives the fastest horse and off he goes, clickety clack. Later on, the merchant goes to town and there sees Lady Death in town and said to Lady Death, said, what are you doing here? You scared my servant to death. He was here today and he is just out of his mind because he saw you. And Lady Death said, me scared, me startled, your servant, no. I was surprised because I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. I'll see him there. You and I have an appointment and you and I will keep it. I almost kept mine this week down there on the freeway with that gas tank that could have been ruptured and exploded. But you and I have a hope and our hope is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. And then Solomon continues on in verse 11 through 18 and he says, life is not predictable. How many of you know that life is not fair? Say yes. yes. You know life isn't fair. He starts out in verse 11 and 12 and says abilities do not guarantee success. Olympic swimmer Ian Thorpe several years ago, he was the fastest in the 400 meter freestyle and he was set to win. He set himself up in the uh, practice run on the blocks ready to go and when he set up Something happened. I don't know what happened. He fell into the, into the water. He got out and he appealed to the judge and to the panel of three judges. Would you please, would you please forgive me? Just let this. They said, no, we can't let that pass. The rules said, that's it. It has to be as it was. He was disqualified. And Solomon says this right here. He says, your abilities do not guarantee that you're always going to get chosen. Look what he says in verse 11. Providence is at work. God is at work in every person's life. But he says this, the swift will not always win the race. The common fable among us, the tortoise and the hare. Help us remind ourselves of this from time to time. And then he says, the strong do not always win the battle. David and Goliath. You may have the better resume, but you've given it at work and you've been passed over by some coworker down the hall and you can't understand it. And the tendency is to get mad at God. Well, did God cause that? No, that person chose that with their free will. They have chosen someone besides you and it hurts. And there you are hit with all the reality of that. Then he says, smart people don't always acquire all the wealth. And so in verse 11, it says, sometimes you just say you're at the right place, the right time for the right opportunity, just paraphrasing what is being said. Verse 12, he says, calamity stalks every person's path. And in James chapter four, he talks about that where he talks about planning ahead. And he said, the reality is you should say, if God allows, we'll be able to do this. 
because if God doesn't allow, it's not going to happen. Senator Max Cleland served our nation in Vietnam conflict, like some of you, and then later he served as a senator for our nation. And Max went to a Bible study where the chaplain of the Senate was and several senators, and one senator said to Max, said, Max, something's bothering you. What's bothering you? And he said, well, something is bothering me. I keep having this recurring dream. I had this recurring dream when I was in Vietnam, when I lost both of my legs and lost my right hand. There was this, this grenade. I don't know how my grenade went off, and I just keep having this recurring dream, and it's, it's like a nightmare. Two days later on the History Channel, his story aired. Maybe you saw it. When it aired, it was describing the story as best he knew it from his perspective. But the fact of the matter is, he did not understand everything that happened. And so he's describing it on there, and they're telling the story for him. But there's a fellow watching down in Virginia, I believe it was, and as he is watching this, this story unfold on the History Channel, he says no. So he got in touch with Mac Cleland and said, that's not what happened. He said, one of, your, one of your guys, and he mentioned who he was, he was an underling, he said, that guy was prepared to jump out of the plane one of his grenades that he had already pulled the pin had flopped out of his belt and stayed in the chopper when we were there. Max, you dove on that to save the rest of us. How do I know this? I was in the, in the helicopter. And by, uh, being in the helicopter, I realized that you were in trouble and I jumped over on you then to bind you up and get you to the hospital. Next day or two, he went to another chapel, and he said, I feel like a great weight has been lifted off of me. I now know the truth about this. And they had been studying Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. And so now when he was hurrying around, though he has now passed away, but at that time, he would hurry around, and if he would see the chaplain of the Senate, he would say, remember, things don't work out. God works things out. He had come to an understanding. So Solomon writes toward the end of this chapter a parable. It's not a fairy tale, but it's almost like a story, an illustration that he's given to us. And as he writes this, he says there's this great army and they're coming through and they're mowing everybody down. But they finally came out through Pennsylvania, paraphrasing, and they came to the Cherryville light, looked around Cherryville. We don't have an army, so they can't overtake us, right? Well, yeah, they could easily. We couldn't really defend ourselves. But there's a beggar, and the beggar knows what's going on, and the beggar says, ha, I've got a great idea, and the beggar's idea works, and they move on. We win. And so we start hoisting the beggar up on our shoulders and ho uh, uh, running him around and high-fiving him and having a parade and all the things that go with that. But about a day later, we forget that he's the one that had saved our bacon. So we just put him down, and then we start hailing everybody else and having this great party, forgetting about him. And that's what Solomon is saying. You may absolutely have all these things that will happen around you, but the fact of the matter is... They may forget you just about as quickly as you were there. You and I are called to live meaningful lives, even though we know one day we'll die, and we know we're going to have unfair mysteries that are all around us. So how are we then to live? Well, Solomon, who has really not talked a lot about God and about our connection to God happening at the end of life, as we move through these last chapters, we'll do that. But he talks to us about living life under the sun, verse 7 through 10. Look at it. He says, first of all, enjoy your meals. There's, there's something beautiful about sitting down at the table and enjoying a meal with your family. And on Father's Day, what a privilege to focus on something like that. Look at verse 8. Enjoy family celebrations. You and I have opportunities, if we can temporize this, the Jewish feasts that would take place, the historic... Uh, realities of his world were his, but ours are ours, and we would understand them in coming together around the table of God and around our friends and family in celebration. And in verse 9, if you're married, enjoy your spouse. And I would say if you're single, enjoy your singleness. And then in verse 10, enjoy productive hard work. You realize there was work before the fall happened. 
As a matter of fact, they were called to gather their fruit and to do whatever. That's a bit of work. But the curse came, and then there was a curse to work to where it became a real job, and it became real work. But I'm going to bring this next thought that we're going to be moving toward over the next little bit as we land this to this. Here we are on Father's Day. Dad, you and I have a choice. You and I have a choice. You and I will leave this place. You and I will leave this place. I think I said that you and I will be leaving this place. And when we do, we'll go somewhere to eat. Some diner, some table at the home. We'll go someplace to eat, right? Longhorn, Texas Roadkill, someplace, we'll go. <laughs> and we'll be there, and it'll be a wonderful occasion, right? And we'll lead our kids to our house, right? If they still live under your roof, you'll lead them to your house. You've led them into church. The percent of families that stay in the faith is very high. When fathers, when we lead our family in the faith, that they stay in the faith, it's very, very high if the father leads them. It's nearly 70% of the families will stay in the faith if the dad will take the leadership. But Jesus put it this way in John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Cure for heart trouble right here. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and will take you to be with me that where I am, that's where you shall be also. This is what Jesus is offering and saying to you and me. And I want to encourage you, fathers, on this. Remember that death is real. Remember that life is going to be unfair. When one of the famous preachers in our land right now said his son was being groomed to be the high school quarterback, got passed over. He said, we were driving on, and I told my son, you might as well get used to it. Life will throw, will throw you more of these situations. You don't get bitter at God. No, you just deal with it. And you move on, and the fact of the matter is, we have the opportunity, listen, to lead them to God, His house. You may or may not go to this church. That's your business. But boy, oh, how do you want to go to heaven? And you have the influence, opportunity on your family. I've heard it said, and next week we'll deal a little bit more with the idea of youthfulness and young people. But I've heard it said, I'm going to just let my kids grow up and they're going to decide. It is true that they have a will and they will decide whether they'll follow God, right? That's going to happen. But I also know that as parents, go back into the scriptures, go into Deuteronomy and different places. It talks to us, we have a responsibility to teach them and teach the next generation and teach the next generation. So let's keep doing it. Lord, thank you for letting us be together today. We thank you for conquering death. We thank you for offering us life, eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, through the confession of sin and total trust and belief in you, we have that assurance. We thank you for that. Lord, we know that there are a lot of challenges that are thrown against uh, people who follow you in faith and the people who do not know you and don't follow you at all. Life is not always easy, oftentimes very hard. But Lord, as we move through this thing called life, we thank you that you have promised to go with us through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We lean into you and ask you to lead us in the way that we should go, not just so we can have an easy way, but so we can make the difference in this world you're calling us to make, that we can reflect your likeness, your image, your holiness into a world that is so crazy and so unhinged. For this, we give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.